Praise the Lord. Shall we rise up, please? Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name for this retreat. We thank you because you have gathered us together so that you can do something great, something gracious, and something marvelous in every one of our lives. And we're praying, oh Lord, this will be a retreat with a difference in Jesus' name. We're praying that all your people, your children who are gathered here will receive a visitation from heaven in Jesus' name. We pray that nobody will come here, either regular members or invitees or visitors. Nobody will come and go back empty-handed in Jesus' name. And we're praying that will shower the blessings of heaven down. And your mighty power will be upon every one of us in Jesus' name. From this very night, we pray that you start to bless us. And you continue to bless us at the very end of the retreat. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless every one of you. I welcome everyone to this retreat in Jesus' name. It's going to be a special time in the presence of the Lord. And you can make it a special time as you receive the word of God and as you send your request unto the Lord in prayer. I welcome those of us in various locations here in Nigeria and West Africa, Central Africa, Southern Africa and Eastern Africa and outside Africa. And I pray that as the Lord is blessing the people of God here, He'll be blessing you too there in Jesus' name. You are not strangers to our retreats. It's a time of coming together. And it's a time of receiving from heaven. It's a time when the word of God comes to us in concentrated fashion from morning all through the evening. If you pick up your program now, I want to show you something. You will see that in the various sections of the messages, we have lined up everything so that it will be a blessing to you. Early in the morning, we have faith clinic. And you'll see that the faith clinic this time is centered on different characters. And by the time you go through the faith clinics, and you have all these characters reproduced in you, that of David, that of Deborah, and that of Daniel, I'm sure that you'll go back home and go back to your places of work, a renewed man, an energetic woman, a person that cannot be on it, that cannot be intimidated, or you cannot be made to run away from the task the Lord has given you. And then you come to the morning messages, then you come to the Bible teaching, then the Bible studies, and then the evangelism and outreach. Then the evening messages and the spiritual renewal. The spiritual renewal, which is what we have tonight, I want to speak about a little. You'll find that every evening we have messages centered on the last week of the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth. And we're starting tonight because we're remembering the time of Easter. That's why I've lined up those messages you come in the morning, you come all through the day, you come in the evening, you'll go back home with victory. We're looking at a supernatural assistance in difficult situations. That's what we're dealing with tonight and then tomorrow night. Not guilty, but scourged and crucified. It's still talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number three, the point of no return. That's talking about... Still the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, the time of his betrayal. And you'll see the people that played one role or the other when we come to that message. And then number four, which is the last, Sunday, uh, the last night on Sunday, we'll be having Christ's resurrection and post-resurrection appearances. I believe that you are in for a revival and you are in for miracles. And every time you come in here, you hear the word of God. I believe that there will be the mighty touch of the Lord in your life. In Jesus' name. 
Tonight we're looking at the message supernatural assistance. Supernatural assistance in difficult situations. You don't need for me to tell you what assistance is all about. Everyone in this world needs help. Everyone in this world needs assistance. And much of the help we have, much of the assistance we have is human, is natural. And sometimes you'll find human help is good. But it reaches only so far. And natural help is great. But it's limited. It reaches only so far. You come to a situation in your life when human help Natural help cannot be enough. You take the case of Moses before Pharaoh. The assistance he needed was super, superhuman, supernatural. And you think about Moses and the children of Israel at the Red Sea. The assistance they needed was not just human, not just natural. They needed supernatural assistance. Now you come to Joshua. And you see Joshua around the walls of Jericho. Natural help will not do you. Natural assistance will not do you. They needed supernatural assistance. Now we come to the life of Jesus Christ himself. He needed help. He needed assistance. He needed support. He needed association and cooperation from other people. And yet, at this time... Even the human help was not forthcoming. And even if that came, it would not be sufficient. He needed supernatural assistance. Let's look at Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, I'm reading to you from verse 39. Luke chapter 22, verse 39. And he came out... And went as he, as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. And kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great draws of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. That's the passage we're looking at. And it tells us about the Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. That Garden of Gethsemane means the time, the period of agony and suffering and sorrow. In fact, he said, my soul is sorrowful unto death. And when you come to such a situation, when you are sorrowful, when you are sad, when you are suffering emotionally, when you are agonizing, and the agony is so much that it may break your heart, tear you apart, wear you down, make you to crumble, crush you, oppress you to the point of destroying you. Maybe you've passed through such a situation before, and you needed help all around, but the help was not coming. The Lord Jesus Christ told his own disciples, when you compare parallel passages, that is other passages of scripture in the New Testament, talking about the same event. He told them, he said, my soul is sorrowful unto death. And he said, watch with me, pray with me, come along with me, and assist me. He wanted their natural help. Their natural assistance, human help, 
human assistance. But the assistance was not forthcoming. That's what I read to you just now. In verse 45, he found them sleeping. They were sorrowful too, but they were sleeping. They were grieved too, but they were sleeping. And they were having this desperation as well. But do you know what you knew? They couldn't support themselves and they couldn't support the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're told that as Jesus was in this agony of heart, when it says agony, it's talking about the emotion of the Lord Jesus Christ at this time. There was desperation. There was despair. There was discouragement. And it was like oppression within the heart. And it was like a, a turmoil within emotional difficulty. And you know that emotional problems are sometimes much, much greater than physical problems. And they were told that he prayed in verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about his stones cast. And kneeled down and prayed. When you are sorrow, what do you do? When you are suffering, what do you do? When the pressure is much upon your life, what do you do? Oh, many people, they complain. Many people, they talk. Many people, they, they just give up. Many people, they become passive. They cannot do anything. They can neither pray nor do any other thing. They become passive. When you get into sorrow, when you get into problem, when there is affliction and pressure upon your life, many people, they go around talking to people. They just want people to know what they're going through. You're looking for sympathy. But you know, sympathy alone is not enough to help. In the case of Jesus Christ, he prayed. And I want to encourage you, while we're in this retreat, you look at your life, and you have been emotional problem. Are you having financial problem? Are you having disappointment from people you trusted and leaned on so much? Do you have family problem? Or you see that the disappointment in your life is crushing you at this time. What you have to do is what Jesus did. That's why we're looking at this passage. Jesus prayed. And then we're told while he prayed. His prayer was, O oh Lord... I don't want this emotional difficulty, this pressure crushing me at this time to make me deviate from your perfect will. I still want to be at the center of your will. I still want to do everything you have called me to do. Why was he praying like that many times? The difficulties make us deviate from what we know to be right. Many times, pressures of life make us to turn away from the perfect will of God. Many times, our emotional outburst, emotional difficulty, the despair, the discouragement, they will make us to turn away from the very center of the will of God. And so he said, O oh Lord, all I want you to do is your perfect will, so that this agony, this pressure, this emotional difficulty will not turn me aside from the will of God. And then we are told in verse 43, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. There appeared an angel from heaven, strengthening him. What will that mean? Number one, empowering him. He needed power, stamina, to be able to go ahead and do what the Lord has called him to do. Because his birth, his life, everything will culminate at this very point of the crucifixion. And so an angel came from heaven, number one, empowering him, number two. That means energizing him. Many times we're weak in our mind. Many times we're weak in our hearts. Many times we're weak in our emotion. And when there is internal weakness, there is going to be 
an appropriate or then accompanying outward weakness. But then the angel came and strengthened him. That means energized him. Number three, that means the angel came to sustain him. Sustain him. Do you see what it says here? It says that his sweat was like the sweat of blood. That is great drops of blood coming out. The emotion had affected the veins and the nerves and the heart and the internal organs. And the blood already was oozing out of the pores of the body. And if, if it continues like that, medical people will tell you, when sorrow, when grief comes to the point that you are sweating out blood, you can just collapse like that and die. And he shouldn't die. In the, in the get, you know, Gethsemane, he was to go to the cross to die for us. And therefore the angel came and sustained him. Number four, it means it made him strong. Made him strong. And that is what we need. And that is one of the reasons why we came to this retreat. That as we pray, as we call upon the Lord, whatever challenges we find in our lives, whatever difficulties we might be facing at present, that the strength of the Lord will come, the might of the Lord will come, the power of the Lord will come, the energizing of the Lord will come, and then He will make us strong. Number five, it means to strengthen Him to endure. Strengthen him in order to endure. He was to endure something. The suffering. The sorrow. The grief. So that he will not cave in. He will not give up. He will not yield to the desires of the enemy. Therefore, the angel came to strengthen him to endure. Number six is to strengthen him to bear the cross. Oh, that was the major issue here. You see, there may be cross in your life. And it, there may be something you are passing through that there is no way to take that cross away. The, that burden away. And yet, there is supernatural strength that can come to you and lift you up and support you and strengthen you to be able to bear that cross. And then number seven, he was given supernatural strength beyond human strength. Giving supernatural strength beyond human strength. There are some things that human strength cannot carry. Even men who are strong as something. There are some things that their human strength, their natural strength cannot carry. But when you come to the Lord in prayer... And then you say, Lord, here I am. I am as weak as any weak man. I'm soft within. This Lord is likely to crush me and destroy me. I'm asking you, O oh Lord, to give me supernatural strength. And then what the Lord did to our Lord Jesus Christ, our great example, our forerunner, is willing to do for you, and he will do for you in Jesus' name. There appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Supernatural assistance in difficult situations. I divide the message to three parts before we pray. Number one, the desperation. The desperation. Number two, the decision. The decision. Number three, the deliverance. Number one, the desperation of sufferers. The desperation of sufferers. You see, when you are suffering, it may be sickness. When you are suffering, it may be financial reverses. When you are suffering, it may be because of peculiar family problem. When you are suffering, it may be because of disappointments of friends and family. When you are suffering, it may be because of the condition, economic condition of your country. Or it may be because of your own sin, what you have done in the past. There is desperation in that suffering. Number two, the decision and the supplication. The decision and the supplication. 
When we are suffering like that, we need to make up our minds. What are we going to do? Are you going to give up? Then the devil will laugh at you. Are you going to give in? Then you'll be following after the desire and the direction of the devil. That's exactly what the devil wants. He's saying, I am putting the pressure on you. I am making the fire under you. I am surrounding you with all these difficulties and challenges so that you will leave Christ and follow me. And if you yield and you give in, then you make the devil happy and you lose heaven. So, what are you going to do? What are you going to decide? When that stage or moment or emotion of desperation is on you, the decision and the supplication. And then, number three, the deliverance, deliverance from suffering. Let's come back to number one. In number one, I've read it already. Let me read it again. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them, above his stones cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. 44. And being in an agony, he prayed the more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now you see the Lord Jesus Christ there suffering in agony. And then he was desperate. You can see the tone of the prayer. And you can see the words in the prayer. And you can see his emotion coming out and the difficulty, the challenge that he faced. You can see as we read there. By the way, if you were to analyze the condition of the Lord Jesus Christ at this time, what would you say? Number one, you will say, add the feeling of desperation. The feeling of desperation. Your emotion may strengthen you or your emotion may weaken you. Your emotion may bring laughter to you. Your emotion may bring tears and weeping to you. Your emotion may also almost make your heart to fail or your emotion may strengthen your heart. Your emotion can weaken your bones and weaken your nerves or your emotion may strengthen your bones and strengthen your nerves. In this case, the emotion gave him the feeling of desperation. Number two, the failure of disciples. You see, his disciples at this time, when he needed them most, they failed him. His disciples failed him. You are going to find that out in life. That you cannot always re rely on men or women. That's not to say we shouldn't have friends. We need our friends. We need members of the church. We need everybody. But there are times when those people, even if they wanted to help us, they, they, are, they are limited because they cannot reach into our very heart. It's like when Job had a problem and his friends wanted to help him. They wanted to advise him. They wanted to counsel him. They wanted to lift him up. They wanted to build him up. They wanted to strengthen him. But the words that came out of their mouth were very limited indeed. In fact, instead of producing a positive effect, it produced a negative effect. Number two, the failure of disciples. That sometimes when you come into desperation like that, and you are thinking that friends and disciples will help, they fail completely. Number three is the falsehood of defendants. The falsehood of defendants. You know the story. And they came eventually to take the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Peter was there. He drew out his sword, wanting to defend the Lord Jesus Christ. And all he could do was to cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Not only that, you know that eventually, even that Peter himself failed and fell miserably as he denied the Lord Jesus Christ. If you think you have people to defend you, wait until the real issue, 
the real challenge, the real time comes for you to be able to escape from the hands of your enemies. Number four, the fury and the fierceness of the destroyers. The fury and the fierceness of the destroyers. If you will read the whole passage, and you will see what the Jewish people did to be able to come and arrest the Lord Jesus Christ. If you sit back and stand back, you'll be asking yourself, how many people does it take to arrest just one man? How many people does it take to arrest just one man? You know what they did? They actually sent a bunch of soldiers together with officers from the high priest. Many, many of them. And they numbered into hundreds. And they carried lanterns, clubs, and then instruments of war. As if they were actually going to fight against a whole city. And so you find, because of the fury and the fierceness of the destroyers, the desperation was there. As you look around you, and you count, not counting your blessings now, but counting the enemies, counting the difficulties, counting the challenges in your life. How many challenges are there? Maybe at home, maybe in the place of work, maybe in your community. Maybe in the village, you are overwhelmed. But don't mind, this time you are going to have the victory. Because the Bible says, weeping may endure for a night, but we are going to rejoice at the final time. Number five, the fear of defeat. The fear of defeat. As you look at your life, and you see the challenges that face you, and then you become afraid. Is this going to stop my Christian journey? Is this going to stop my professional progress? Is this going to stop the favor of God and the favor of the people coming unto me? Am I getting to the edge of the road? Or will I still be able to have the strength and the power to carry on the fear of defeat? That's what brings us to desperation. That's what makes us to go all out to say, this problem must be solved. I must not fail at this time. Number five, the flood of discouragement. The flood of discouragement. You see, when you come to a situation like that, and you become very, very desperate, it will be as if the devil had been waiting for this very time. And then the devil says this and this and this and that. It becomes a flood of discouragement in your life. Uh, have you noticed in the case of Job that the wickedness of the devil came to the very height? What I mean is this. You know that eventually when the Lord said, All right, you're arguing about Job, that he's serving me because of the blessings I'm giving him. I give you permission to go and try him, but spare his life. Then the devil went all out. And then somebody came and said, we're all there. Everybody died because the house fell on them. Except myself alone to come and give you the information. The devil only spared the people that will give Job the information as to what evil sin had happened to his children. And then the fire came and burnt all his farm. And again, the only one that escaped was the one that came to give information to him. I saw it. And then he described it to Job. You see, that will bring a flood of discouragement. Not only that, his cattle. Uh, the Sabians came and stole everything. And then they even, they destroyed everything and drove away or killed all the servants, the herdsmen. And the only one that the devil spared was the one to come and give the information. And then eventually, he had boils all over. All children died. All the cattle gone. All the servants gone. And the only one remaining now, that was his wife. And then the wife said, cause God and die. How is it that the only one that remained to be able to comfort Job was the one that was even increasing the problem of Job. When things come like that, there'll be a flood of discouragement. 
If it is happening to you today, cheer up. Victory is on the way. And we shall win in this battle in Jesus' name. You know, when you understand that whatever you are going through today, all the people have gone through that before, and the Lord brought them out, and the Lord brought them through, then you have the confidence in the Almighty God. The Lord who brought them out will bring you out. And the Lord who brought them through will bring you through. But you need to understand that the desperation you are facing today is nothing peculiar, it's nothing special. Other people have gone through that before and you will go through. Number seven is a fog of depression. The fog of depression. And if there is anything that actually, uh, you know, makes a person not to want to rise up to do anything at all, it is depression. To de uh, depression. Uh, what you know what that means it's like the devil has impressed his finger on your life and because of the impression of the devil's finger in your life then there is depression that is in your heart right now and it's like when somebody is depressed the shoulders are down the face is down and the mind is down and his whole life is crumbled. It's like nothing can be done again. Depressed. But if you are depressed today, by the time we finish tonight, even tonight, you'll come up in Jesus' name. You know what the devil wants to do is to pack up and go back home. What the devil wants you to do is to give up and say there is no use trying again. What the devil wants you to do is to give into his program. And to say, I will not follow the Lord anymore. I'm not going to follow the devil, but Satan is a liar. We're going to follow the Lord till the end of our lives in Jesus' name. I've shown you about the Lord Jesus Christ and the time of his own desperation. Can I show you some other examples of desperation? In First Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19. I'm reading to you from verse 1. In 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 1, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me. And more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die he requested for himself that he might die he requested for himself that he might die you see depression causes people to want to die and if they're not christians they might kill themselves and if you are there, the suggestion of the devil has been coming to you. Why don't you die? You will not die. You will live. Because all those things the devil is bringing upon your life as pressure. Like a flood in your life. Wanting to overwhelm you. Tonight, everything will be taken away. And so, Elijah said, Lord, there's nothing else for me to do now. I give up. I give up the ministry. I give up all the projects I have in front of me. I don't even want to think about anything now. I don't want to live anymore. You can tell depression had come. Desperation had come to the man. And the fear of death. That is the fear of death. He didn't want uh, Jezebel to come and kill him. Because of that, that's why I requested that he will die. He said, now, O oh Lord, take my life. For I am not better than my fathers i'm not better than my fathers when that kind of desperation comes upon you you begin to make unnecessary comparison 
And then your vision is clouded. You become blind to all the achievements of the past. It's like my life is useless. I am nothing. I am worth nothing. What can I do? What have I done? Why am I living? That's discouragement talking. You'll come out of it tonight. And then in, they were looking at uh, Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. If you are in desperation, other people have been there. And the good news is, they were there, they didn't stay there. They came out. And you are there tonight, you will not stay there, you will come out. Desperation will not be the last chapter of your life. Desperation, this discouragement will not be the last chapter of your life. In Jesus' name, the others came out of it quick. And tonight, you are coming out of it quick. Numbers chapter 11. And I'm reading to you from verse 10. Numbers 11 verse 10. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families. Every man in the door of his stage. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. And Moses was displeased. And Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore? As thou afflicted thy servant, and wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the body of all these people upon me? Have I conceived all these people? Have I got have I begotten them? That thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the sucking child. Unto the land, we thou swearest unto their fathers, when should I have flesh to give unto all these people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. For I have found, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. Again, you will see the condition of Moses here. He had this feeling of desperation. The Levites were not able to help him. The failure of his own disciples and the falsehood of the defendants, even Joshua and Caleb, where were they by, the, by this time? The fury and the fierceness of the people. And he said, give us flesh to eat. If you don't solve our problem now, we're going to lynch you. They'll be almost ready to stone me. And the fear of the fear that I will not be able to carry these people on. I'll not be able to leave them again. They are out of control. That kind of fear came upon him as a leader. And then the fog of depression and the flood of discouragement came upon him all of a sudden. That's why he went to the Lord in prayer. Although the kind of prayer he was praying wasn't actually the way he should have prayed. But he prayed all the same in Second Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. You might say those are Old Testament people that we have read about in First Kings chapter 19. In Numbers chapter 11, do we have any case in the New Testament, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, the people of God in the New Testament, that went through that same situation of depression, desperation, and of uh, uh, fearing defeat? Let's look at Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8. In Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have ye ignorant, of our troubles which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, that we despaired even of life. Here was Paul the Apostle. He said, we were pressed out of measure, and we despaired even of life, for we had the sentence of death in ourselves. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. Who delivered us from so great a death? The Lord will deliver you. And does deliver. And in whom we trust, that he will yet deliver us. 
Do you see what uh, Paul the Apostle is saying in verse 10? He said, we went in, but we didn't stay in. We went through. We went into difficulty. We went into despair. We went into depression. But thank God, we didn't stay there. We went in, we went out, we went through. And he said, he delivered us, past tense, in the present tense, and he does deliver. And then in the future, our faith, our confidence, our trust, our reliance on the Lord is that he will yet deliver us. When you have that verse 10 reaching upon the tables of your heart, that you know he delivered us in the past, he's delivering us now in the present, and whatever challenges come in the future, he will yet deliver us. That will make you to pray. And as you pray, God will answer your prayer. I come to point number two now. The decision and the supplication. In difficult times, make up your mind. The decision and the supplication. In challenging times, make up your mind. The decision and the supplication. The natural tendency of man... When you have difficulty, it may be family difficulty to run to your mother, to run to your, to run to your father, or to run to the people in the church and begin to complain and begin to, you know, murmur and begin to say, this is happening, that is happening. That's natural. Anybody can do that. We don't need to have grace to murmur. We don't need to have grace to complain. We don't need to have grace to run to mommy and run to daddy and run to in-laws and run to friends and run to members of the church and complain. Complaining doesn't take grace, but it takes grace for you to remember there is a God in heaven. And that that God in heaven is greater than father, is greater than mother, is greater than everybody around. And if you will go to God and lay your complaint at the doorstep of the almighty God, he will solve all your problems in Jesus' name. The decision and the supplication when Jesus came to the time and to the point of desperation. What did he do? He prayed. Let's look at it. Mark chapter 14. In Mark chapter 14, reading from verse 32. Mark 14, 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And it says to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John. And begin to be so amazed and to be heavy, very heavy. And says unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward. A little and he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible the hour might pass from him and he said Abba father all things are possible unto thee take away this call from me nevertheless not what I will but what thou wilt as I told you before the Lord he is a savior the Lord Jesus Christ, He is our Redeemer, our Lord, but He is also our perfect example. Everything that happened in the life of Jesus happened for a reason. And it is to help us to say, whenever I get to a similar situation, if I don't want to remain in that situation, if I want to come out of that situation, I will do what Jesus did. What did He do? He prayed. He prayed. He made a supplication unto the Lord. And God always answers. And when you pray, God will answer. Everybody you take to the Lord during this retreat, God will answer. Every, every tear that was shed. And every remembrance of the promise of God that you make during this retreat, the Lord will give you an answer. Your tears will not overwhelm you. Your difficulties will not destroy you. The challenges you are facing right now will not stop your journey. 
the Lord will give you many, many years to enjoy the promises of God in your life. Jesus prayed, and we should pray. How did he pray? Number one, he prayed to the Father. He prayed to the Father. I'm sure that the majority of us here, we know that our Father which art in heaven. When you pray, you pray to the Father. Paul the Apostle said, I bend my knees before the Father, the Father of all flesh. And Jesus prayed to the Father and he taught us to pray to the Father. You are not praying to angels, never. You are not praying even to Jesus directly. We are praying to the Father in the name of Jesus. And then number two, he prayed with faith. And that's how we are to pray. When you bring your bodies to the Lord, when you bring your challenges to the Lord, when you bring your difficulties to the Lord, when you bring your desperation to the Lord, during this retreat, you pray with faith. Because if you have faith, and I know you have faith, I said you have faith. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, this mountain of depression, desperation confronting you, get removed into the sea. If you don't doubt in your heart, you will have what you say. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. If he has committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Number three, he prayed without fear. He prayed without fear. He was there in the garden. And he knew that Judas is carried or the bands of men and the officers may come any time. And yet, he was not just closing his eyes, opening his eyes, looking forward and looking back, thinking that maybe something will happen. He prayed without fear. And as you come to the Lord, your enemies cannot follow you here. I said your enemies cannot follow you here. Forget about them. We're in the presence of the Almighty God. And no evil power can destroy you on this ground because you have come to seek refuge in the presence of the Almighty God. When you come to the Lord, you pray without fear. Number four, you pray without fainting. Pray without fainting. Isn't that what Jesus Christ himself tells us how we ought to pray in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Luke chapter 18 verse 1 And he spake a parable To this end That men ought always to pray And not to fade Always to pray And not to fade Number 5 Very important It's very very important He prayed With forgiveness He prayed With forgiveness you see, you ought to pray with forgiveness. That's why Jesus Christ said, If you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Please come to Mark chapter 11. In Mark chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 22. And Jesus answering says unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. He shall have whatsoever he says. Therefore, in verse 24, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Verse 25, and when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any. You see, when we forgive, we're helping ourselves. When we don't forgive, we're hurting ourselves. And then what you need to do is this. You compare the blessing you are looking for, the deliverance you are looking for, the healing you are looking for, the victory you are looking for. You compare that with this little offense that somebody offended you. And then you come before the Lord, you want to pray. 
you are holding on to that offense. That fellow hurt me. That fellow injured me. That fellow embarrassed me. That fellow oppressed me. You are holding on to that. While you are holding on to that, the thing you are asking for will not be given. You ask yourself, which one is greater? This little offense that somebody has offended me, or the, the great blessing, the great miracle that I'm asking from the Lord. Of course, your miracle is greater. And you cannot have both. You cannot have bitterness in your heart towards that person and have the miracle at the same time. Therefore, you let go and you let God. When you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any. That your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. So then, number five, pray with forgiveness. Number six, pray in fellowship. Pray in fellowship. He wanted the fellowship of his disciples. Come along with me and watch and pray along with me. You see, that's the prayer of agreement. And when you come into agreement and fellowship with your brothers and sisters, with the people of God on your retreat ground, I say that because of those who are also outside who are not here. Our retreat ground here, yes, and the retreat ground over there as well. We pray in unity together, the same heart with your fellow brothers, the same mind with your fellow brothers and sisters. Pray in fellowship. Number seven, pray for the fordrance of the glory of God. Pray for the fordrance of the glory of God. Lord, I want this done just because of your will. Just because I want the fordrance of your glory. Not my will, but thine be done. That's how the Lord has taught us to pray. And if you pray aright like that, your prayers will be answered. Give me a good amen. amen. In Psalm 5. Psalm 5, we're talking about our decision and supplication. Psalm 5, verse 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shall thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee. And will look up in verse 12 of that same Psalm 5. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. Wilt thou compass him as with a shield? Psalm 18. In Psalm 18, reading from verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. The sorrows of death compass me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compass me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress I called upon the Lord. In my distress, in my depression, in my desperation, in my discouragement, in my defeat, in my sorrows, in my, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto, unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Verse 16, he sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He will draw you out. He delivered me from my strong enemy. I thank God your deliverance has come. And from them which hate me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord will deliver you. Psalm 86. In Psalm 86, we're reading from verse 7 to verse 12. Psalm 86, 
from verse 7. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. That's why you came. There is no problem in your life that the Lord cannot solve. There is no challenge that comes upon you today that the Lord cannot remove. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods, there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name, for thou art great and doest wondrous things. And thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify thy name forevermore. If we will pray, the answer will come. I said the answer will come. I come to point number three. Deliverance from suffering. Deliverance from suffering. Do you know that tonight is your night? And that deliverance is going to happen to you tonight in Jesus' name. In uh, Luke again, I'm looking at Luke again from chapter 22. The deliverance from suffering. Luke chapter 22, reading from verse 41. And it was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. And kneeled down and prayed. In verse 43, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. Do you notice in verse 41, he prayed. In verse 43, an angel came and strengthened him. Then in verse 44, he prayed more earnestly. The coming of the angel had strengthened him. Now, as you look at the ministry of Jesus, or the life of Jesus, you will see the appearance of angels very much. For example, you think about the announcement of the conception of Christ. An angel came to make that announcement. And then, when Jesus uh, was conceived of Mary, Joseph was thinking of putting her away. And again, an angel came unto Joseph to rescue that situation. And eventually, Jesus Christ was born. And when Herod was about to destroy all the children, thinking that he will destroy Jesus Christ, an angel appeared unto Joseph, where to take the Lord Jesus Christ to in his infancy, to be protected. And then when Herod was dead, an angel appeared again, telling Joseph, you can come back now. He, because the fellows seeking the, the life of the child, they are all dead. And then Jesus was growing up. And you remember when he had been baptized in water. Coming out of the water, the Holy Ghost came upon him like a dove. And the voice of the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And he was then led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. At the end of those days of temptation, again, an angel appeared, strengthening him again. And you'll find all through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, angel, angel, angel. Now we come to this place. And it was in the garden of Gethsemane. In the garden of Gethsemane, when it was in deep sorrow, an angel came, strengthening him. Eventually he went to the cross and he died. He was buried. And when he was to rise up, an angel came from heaven and rolled away the stone. And then eventually he appeared to his own disciples. After 40 days of infallible proof, appearing to his own disciples, he went into heaven. As he was going to heaven, the disciples were looking at him, and then angels appeared again. And the angels said, ye men of Galilee, why are you standing here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, whom you have seen going up, will so come in like manner. And then when he will come again, we are told, the heavens will open. And then Jesus will come in the clouds. And his holy angels will come with him. And so you find the ministry of angels in bringing deliverances to the people of God. The question is this. The angels, did they only minister to Jesus Christ? 
Were they available to strengthen the people of God, to help the people of God, to protect the people of God before the time of Christ? How about after the time of Christ? Let's look at the time before Christ. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. I'm reading from verse 4 to verse 7. Psalm 34. Reading from verse 4 to verse 7. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. He will deliver you. They looked unto him, and they were lightened. And their faces were not ashamed. You will not be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. How many troubles will he save you from? All. Verse 7. The angel of the Lord encompass round about them that fear him and delivereth them. The angel of the Lord encamping around the people that fear the Lord and he delivers them. Psalm 91. In Psalm 91, I'm reading from verse 11. Psalm 91, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample on the feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him, I will set him on high, because he has known my name. Again, you will see there the angels of the Lord having charge, having commandments to protect the people of God. You are protected already. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, remember, you remember this story? This is the time that Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. And then God sent his angel to protect that righteous man. Daniel chapter 6 from verse 19. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel. And I shut the lion's mouths. All the lions against your life, God will send his angel, and those, and those lions' mouths will be shut in Jesus' name. <laughs> that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him, innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. You will see then that the angels of the Lord held, supported, strengthened, protected, surrounded the people of God during the time of the Old Testament before Christ. What happened after Christ had gone to heaven? Did the angels stop ministering to the people of God? Because now Jesus had died on the cross and Jesus was buried and Jesus rose again. Do we find any ministry of the angels of God after Christ? Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 17. Acts 5 verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were within, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and they laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. And, but the angel of the Lord, there we are again, but the angel of the Lord, by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. The angels have not stopped ministering, and the angels are still there today. You may not see them, but they are there. And you will not go through any harm. God will send his angels. They will protect you in Jesus' name. 
Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 5. Acts chapter 12, reading from verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord. There we again. Behold, the angel of the Lord. Behold, the angel of the Lord. You might be the Peter today. And the people of this world, they put you in their prison. Maybe it's not the physical prison. Maybe it's not the one that we can see. But they put you in a cage. The cage will be open tonight. Those prison doors are open tonight. You are not a person to be in bondage. You are supposed to be free. And the angel of the Lord came to that prison. In verse 7, he came to him. And the light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter by the side and raised him up. He will raise you up. Saying, Arise up quickly. Tonight, tonight. Arise up quickly. Tonight, tonight. Be delivered very quickly. Tonight, be set free very quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. Your chains are falling off already. Your bondage is falling off already. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garments about thee, and follow me. And he went out, and followed him. And wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel. But thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and the second watch, they came unto the iron gate that led us into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. Those doors will open tonight. And they went out and passed on through the one street. And forthwith the angel departed from him. When Peter was come to himself, he said, now I know of his surety. Tonight you will know. Yeah. Can you say that with me? Now I know of his surety. Now I know. Say it with assurance. Now I know. That he and he has delivered me. And he has delivered me. Out of the, out of the hand of Herod. And from the expectation of the people of the Jews. You are free tonight. I said you are free tonight. Remember supernatural assistance is available for you tonight. Supernatural help is available for you tonight. All your chains are broken. All your difficulties are gone. If you have not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, don't waste time. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. And all the help you need, all the assistance you need, all the power you need, all the spiritual energy you need will be yours tonight in Jesus' name. If the devil is trying to accuse you of anything, saying you've done this bad thing, you've done this bad thing, just go to Calvary and say, Lord Jesus, wash me in your precious blood. Immediately you'll be washed and cleansed and then all the help you need will be available for you. Tonight, miracles are going to start in our lives. Deliverances are going to start in our lives. And the protection of the Lord will begin our lives even tonight in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and make this night the beginning of great things in your life? The beginning of the manifestation of the power of God in your life. The beginning of deliverances in your life. Forget every other thing. Abandon every other thing. And just look up to the Lord Almighty and say, Tonight is my night. I need supernatural help. I need supernatural assistance. I need supernatural support, energy, power. Even tonight. And tonight it will be given unto you. Tonight is that night. When the Lord will open your prison doors. Tonight is that night. When the Lord will open that cage. Tonight is that night. When the Lord will supernaturally help you. Assist you. All depression gone. 
all discouragement gone. All things that the devil is trying to stamp in your life. Everything gone tonight. Yours is the victory. Yours is the victory. Yours is the victory. Yours is the victory. Victory is yours tonight. Victory is yours tonight. What's it that is causing that depression in your life? What's it that is bringing you desperation in your life? If you appeal to the Lord tonight, if you pray unto the Lord tonight, the Lord will strengthen you. The Lord will empower you. The Lord will energize you. The Lord will sustain you from within. He will make you strong. You'll be able to walk and you'll not be weary. You will run and you will not fail. You need help tonight? Pray to the Lord. You need support tonight? Pray unto the Lord. You need courage tonight? Pray unto the Lord. You need the power of the Almighty to sustain, to support you tonight? Pray unto the Lord. You need a miracle tonight? Pray unto the Lord. You want your prison doors to be open tonight? Pray unto the Lord. You are expecting healing tonight? Pray unto the Lord. You are expecting strength in your soul, energy in your soul, power in your soul tonight? Pray unto the Lord. You are expecting a breakthrough tonight? Pray unto the Lord. There is no room for depression. There is no room for discouragement. There is no room for defeat. There is no room for the destroyer to walk ever in your life again. Yours is a victory. Yours is a victory. Success is yours. Supernatural strength is yours. Supernatural help is yours. All your desires, all your good desires are fulfilled. Come out of darkness. Come out of gloom. Come out of discouragement. Come out of that prison. Don't lock yourself up. Come out. Be bold. The Lord is on your side. The will of God will be done in your life. The devil will not overwhelm you. His difficulties will not overwhelm you. You cannot drown in the sea of discouragement. Help has come. Supernatural assistance has come. Just pray. Just pray. Make your supplication unto the Lord. Oh Lord, help me. Help will come. Oh Lord, help me, help will come. Oh Lord, assist me, assistance will come. Support me, support will come. Encourage me, courage will come. Deliver me, deliverance will come. He will help you. You are a candidate for his help. You are a candidate for his assistance. You are a candidate for his power. You are a candidate for the solution to the problems you have today. Help has come. Solution has come. The power to sustain. That power has come tonight. That's why you are here. You will overcome. You have overcome already. This retreat will spell victory in your life. This retreat will spell dominion in your life. You are going to overcome. The devil cannot have the final say. But the word of the Lord, the word of power, will take root, will take effect in your life. Be definite, 
be specific about the challenge you are facing. Be definite. Be specific about the problem that is trying to overwhelm you. Be definite and be specific about the difficulties that's about to swallow you up and present you before the Lord. A personal problem, a spiritual problem, a domestic problem, a financial problem, professional problem, whatever. Present ye before the Lord. Bodies are littered at Calvary. Yokes are broken in the presence of the Lord. Present everything before the Lord and believe the Lord. You are praying to the Father and you are praying with faith. Asking without wavering. Nothing doubting. He has helped other people. He will help you. Nothing doubting. He is answering other people. He will answer you. Nothing doubting. Nothing doubting. Why should you doubt? He is your father. Why should you doubt? He is faithful. Why should you doubt? His promises are yes and amen. Why will you ever doubt? His power will never fail. Why will you doubt? He says, come. And he wants to bless you. Why will you ever doubt? He wants to bless your life. Pray with faith. Nothing doubting. Pray without fear. There is nothing to fear on earth. In the sea. Or in the sky. Nothing to fear. Your life will be lifted up by the Lord. Your life will be sustained by the Lord. Nothing to fear. Say, Lord, here I am. I give myself. I surrender myself unto you. Let your will be done in my life. Pray with faith. Pray without fear. Don't faint. Men not always to pray and not to faint. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Praying time is powerful time. Praying time is prevailing time. This is when to prevail. Praying without fainting. And pray with forgiveness. Has anybody hurt you? Forgive. Has anybody offended you? Forgive. Has anybody stepped on your toes? Forgive. Has anybody insulted you, embarrassed you? Forgive. Don't allow that little hurt, that little problem to hinder your prayer. And pray in the fellowship of the people of God. Agree together. Agree together. Let's be of one accord. Miracles are taking place now. Healings are taking place now. Deliverances are taking place now. Signs and wonders have been loaded upon us now. Let's pray in unity together, in fellowship together. And let us pray for the furtherance of the kingdom of God and the glory of God and the gospel of Christ. He will send the same jail. They will surround you. They will protect you. Your life will be preserved. In the day and in the night. Be confident in the Lord. Be courageous in the Lord. The Lord will not allow your life to be destroyed by the enemy. You will live your days full. Nothing will touch your life. Nothing will hinder your progress. The Lord is on your side. The Lord is on your side. And tonight, the doors are open. Tonight, the prison walls are broken down. Tonight, sicknesses are healed. 
Tonight, deliverances are given. Tonight, the power of God is in manifestation. If you have not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the time I give myself to Christ. I surrender to Christ. I will not go on with Satan anymore. I will not go on in my sin anymore. I give up. I surrender myself to the Lord. Lord, forgive. Lord, receive me. He will receive you. He will forgive you. You'll never be the same again. Don't allow the guilt of sin to hinder you from receiving the blessing of the Lord. Just say, Lord, forgive me. Take my guilt away. Take my condemnation away. And the Lord will take the condemnation of sin away. He will forgive you. He will totally change your life. Be sure you are forgiven. Be sure you are saved. Be sure you are cleansed. Be sure the condemnation and guilt of sin has been taken away. And then you'll be able to pray with a clear conscience. You'll be able to pray with faith. Sin will not destroy your faith. Guilt Condemnation will not destroy your faith. You'll be able to pray with a clear mind. Standing on the promises of God that cannot fail. Talk to the Lord. He answers prayer. He delivers the people that trust in Him. He delivers the people that will have confidence and faith and trust in Him. Believe. He has never failed and will not fail you. Praying time is prevailing time. The praying time is a progress time. It's a powerful time. It's a time for you to receive encouragement and power from the Lord. Praying time is promotion time. And you prevail upon your enemies, upon the every problem in your life. Praying time is a time of breaking yokes, destroying the works of the devil. And this is the time. Let your heart go straight to the Almighty God and say, Lord, here I am. I need your blessing today. I need your strength today. I need your power today. I need your deliverance today. I need to have dominion today. I need encouragement. I need strength. I need power. Give the Lord a chance and it will work mightily in your life. Give the Lord a chance. Let Him work mightily in your life. Already the work is going on right now. Deliverances are going on right now. Healings are going on right now. The power of the Lord is in manifestation right now. Receive. Receive from the Lord. Pray with faith. And say, Lord, I thank you. I receive. And it is yours already. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you for that. Amen. The Lord has answered your prayer. It's bowed and eyes closed. You are there and you want your guilt to be taken away. You know that you are a sinner. You have never come to Christ. And you do not know peace in Christ. And you want freedom from sin, forgiveness from sin. 
And you want the salvation of the Lord. Your guilt, your condemnation taken away. Remember, Jesus went to the cross and he died for you so that you will not die. So that you will not be lost. So that you will not perish. And you want that forgiveness now, that salvation now. Wherever you are, just raise up your hand. I'll be praying for you. Thank you very much. I'm waiting for you wherever you are. You raise up your hand. In all the various locations wherever we are. You have the burden of sin. You have the guilt of sin. And you are saying, Lord, I want this guilt to be taken away. I want this condemnation to be taken away. I want to have the forgiveness of the Lord. Because I believe Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. Wherever you are, raise up your hand. I want to pray for you. You are raising up your hand. It's a very large crowd. I can't see your hand. If you are raising your hand, take your Bible, your bag, and come to the front of the hall wherever you are. Very quickly. Or just give them chance. Show them the way. Come right to the front. You want the salvation of the Lord, the forgiveness of your sin. Yes, or one, I'm waiting for you. Come out. All two, all three, all four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Keep on coming. We'll be waiting for you. You say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, take my sin away. Lord, make this day the day of my salvation. Make this day the day of my deliverance from sin. Thank you. Keep on coming. Thank you. Ushers, God bless you. Keep on directing them. Wherever you are, you are the back of the hall, you need to come to the front here now. The Lord wants all your sins forgiven because Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Keep on coming. Keep on coming. Praise the Lord, everybody. We shout hallelujah because of you. We're happy because of you that today your sins have been taken away. That's good, that's good. Clap for them as they come. Clap for them as they come. Praise the Lord. If you're still at the back over there, we're waiting for you. Please come, please come. Tonight is salvation night. Tonight is forgiveness night. And tonight is victory night. And in all the various locations, wherever you are, you keep on coming out now so that the Lord will forgive your sins. So that the Lord will take the burden and the load and the guilt of sin away from you. He will do it right now. While you are there in the front, while you are there in the front, will our coordinators and women coordinators please join them uh, so that we can take their names after. Please, uh, coordinators and women coordinators, thank you very much for coming out to join these people and helping them. And those of you who are coming to the front Anywhere you are, you are hearing the sound of my voice now And you are giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ Can you raise up your hand again? Can you raise up your hand again? Thank you very much Thank you very much You say this after me Almighty God I thank you for Jesus I thank you for salvation Lord, I confess That I'm a sinner Lord, I believe that Jesus died for my sin. I come now to receive your forgiveness. I come to receive your salvation. I believe you will not deny me. Forgive me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I believe my sins are forgiven. I believe I am saved because Jesus died for me. In Jesus' name, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you very much. Thank you for those who have come out, the old and the young, the men and the women, the boys and the girls. Lord, I pray you grant every one of them forgiveness and salvation in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, today a new thing will start in their lives. New victory will start in their lives. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Keep on staying there. Our coordinators, leaders will see you later. Everybody now, are you ready for your deliverance? Uh, you know, tonight is a night of miracle. And tonight is a night of power. And tonight is a night of signs and wonders. Every problem in your life, everything will crumble to the ground in Jesus' name. All over, wherever we are now, we are ready for miracle. I am ready for miracle. 
I am ready for miracle. I am ready for miracle. Why don't you raise up your hand and then you lay the hand in any other in any place you have a problem. Anywhere you are, you are blind, you, you can have your sight tonight. You are lame, you can rise up and walk tonight. And you have any swelling in your body, you can go tonight. Any sickness in your body, tonight is a night of miracle. <laughs> By the time we go through all the mornings, all the afternoons, all the evenings in this retreat, we'll sweep every part of the devil away from your life. By the time we finish, there will be no problem remaining. Tonight, you are going to have your breakthrough. Give me a good amen. Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your people here tonight. And I pray you break every yoke in Jesus' name. All the depression of your life, everything is taken away in Jesus' name. All the defeat in your life, everything is taken away in Jesus' name. And the sickness, the disease, the infirmity, the yoke in your life, they are broken tonight in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, I pray, any swelling there, take it away in Jesus' name. Any pain, cancer, tuberculosis, kidney failure, I command you right now, come out in Jesus' name. And near, hunchback, and any other swelling, come out in Jesus' name. Those who are blind, I pray the Lord will stretch his hand to you right now. Open your eyes and see in Jesus' name. And those who are paralyzed, I send the power of God on your body. Rise up and walk in Jesus' name. Everywhere now, shout of miracle. Everywhere now, shout of healing. Every now, now, right, everywhere now, shout of deliverance. Oh Lord, send your power on your people in Jesus' name. And those who are in any dungeon of depression, deliver them right now. Set your people free tonight. Thank you, Lord, because I know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, God bless every one of you. I have got my miracle. I have got my miracle. I have got my miracle. Your miracle will be permanent in Jesus' name.